Welcome to Let's Talk Ed and Zahi. We've been talking about why accreditors are our allies in higher education. And specifically today, what we're going to be talking about is, is how accreditation really is sort of a quality assurance for our teaching and learning and making sure that our students are, are getting the things that we promise that they are supposed to be getting. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, you and I are most uh, acquainted with the accreditation standards and criteria of the Higher Learning Commission. And in it, that we have to be or, or to respond to five big questions. And two of those, uh, in fact, specifically speak about teaching and learning. And it's not invasive in the sense that they're going to sit there and watch our faculty and make sure that you know, what we said in their evaluation meets what they're seeing. That's not what they're doing. Nor are they going to stop people in the hallway and ask them about the mission, like some people uh, have claimed over the years. Uh, you know, and if you fail, if you fail to be able to respond to what the mission is, you know, uh, the college has issues. No. Yes. The mission is, is the number one criterion for, for all of those uh, regional accreditors. Now they've become national accreditors in the last couple of years. But uh, uh, in the sense of, are you living up to the, to the mission of your institution? Are you, in effect, a good servant to the community that's paying you? to the taxpayers of your uh, county, state, uh, and, and uh, the country as a whole. Now, why is it important for accreditors to look into teaching and learning? It's because we have one job, and it is the job of creating the next generation of the workforce. And uh, it is an assumed practice of, of the Higher Learning Commission, for example, that your faculty will meet the minimum qualifiers. It's an assumed practice. The, and that is, if you don't meet, in, we, we have major issues, right? That's why they ask us for a rubric. That's why, you know, they will ask us for, uh, and they've become a little more adamant about it over the last decade, perhaps, is they want to see, they ask you for a number of different uh, faculty names, and they want to see adjunct and full-time, and they want to see their their package to ensure that you are doing what you're doing. But if they find one in a hundred that is eh, on the fence, they're not going to come uh, closing your shop. They're your peers at the end of the day. Now, when it comes to the criteria, once once you've gone through the established and assumed practices, they are looking to ensure that, that when you say we offer quality education, and I dare you to, to find a, uh, an institution of higher learning that doesn't say we offer the best education. Um, how are you qualifying that quality? What kind of resources are you putting behind it? What kind of support are you offering your faculty and your staff members to be on the cutting edge, to be ever improving? And then how are you evaluating it and how are Pardon me, and how are you using those learnings and gaps that you identify to improve? Which means show me how it's full, being folded into your prioritization at the, at the institution and your budget. Well, and, and Zahi, one of the things that, that I really liked about that is, you know, it's that, that support and how many times... Uh, over all of our different podcasts, who we talked about how are we supporting our educators in the classroom? How are we making sure that they are remaining on the cutting edge? Making sure that uh, you know they're they're following the latest teaching uh, best practices and all of those things. So that's something that really here again, I think most places really would want to be doing things like that. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily want to say we're following best practices from 25 years ago because that's that's what we know. Um, and I know sometimes, you know, higher education, it's it's like turning an aircraft carrier where it can be a really slow process, uh, you know, especially compared to 
uh, you know, private businesses that, you know, sometimes can, can be very nimble in what they do. But, you know, here again, I think at, at the heart, everybody wants to be showing how we can improve, how we can make our faculty better. You know, what are the things that we can do? But I think the other part of it, too, is, you know, how are we we putting money behind that? Uh, because some of these things are very difficult to just hope people do if you aren't going to put the money in behind it for them to, you know, go to a conference, for example, or, um, you know, get new certifications, try new equipment, classroom methodologies, all of those things. So, you know, knowing that there are the resources behind all of that to make that go, I think is really, really important. And, you know, the evaluation, evaluation through something that everybody, I think, uh, in any line of work gets a little nervous about evaluations. And, and that's okay. But again, Evaluations should be a, an opportunity for for growth and improvement, and not necessarily solely a punitive thing. Um, you know, here again, I would hope that most people, uh, if you do have somebody that maybe isn't living up to the best standards in the classroom, that they're being told those things and being offered help and resources before, say, an annual evaluation. Uh, comes up so that, you know, that's not the first time they're hearing about those sorts of things. Yes. So I, I uh, in my mind, I equate the regional accreditation as well as the programmatic accreditation. So one for the institution, the other one for, for certain programs, especially in pure technical education. I would equate them to the uh, ISO uh, standards that industry especially on the manufacturing side, the International uh, Standard Organization set of criteria that those entities have to meet. Do they shut down? Do they stop what they're doing? You know, whether it's a car manufacturer or aerospace or a food manufacturer, do they stop because, oh my goodness, there's a frenzy? No, it's, it's embedded in everything that they do. But there's a difference, is that when we hire faculty, for the most part, we're not hiring individuals that went to school to learn how to teach. We are hiring based on subject matter expertise. And we shop them in front of students who need all the assistance that they could. And we're telling them, swim on your own and let the students swim with you. So the, uh, in my opinion, the criteria are intended to help us develop a structure an infrastructure and a structure to allow us to step side by side with our faculty in support of our students. Therefore, we can consistently have to adapt. And the only way our faculty can adapt is if, because they're busy, they're busy up to their eyeballs, is to bring in constant feedback to them and constant tools and constant uh, growth opportunities. But those don't happen because you opine. They happen because you're identifying gaps. There are a couple of ways to identify gaps. Obviously, the evaluative tools, but also the learning outcomes uh, and their assessment identify gaps. And those together allow you to prioritize because invariably you're going to find that it's not one individual that needs it. It's a numerous number of individuals. Therefore, you develop that infrastructure that grows with the growth of your uh, faculty and students. And remember, we constantly have new faculty coming in. We constantly have new students coming in, right? Faculty retire, they move, they resign. Students are finishing in, in, a, in a, you know, as little as one course or as long as, you know, all the way to graduate school. So we need to grow with them. And that's what what those uh, criteria are intended for. They're not intended to tell us, oh, you don't know how to teach or you're doing great job teaching. No. If we identify either uh, of those things, what are we doing with it? 
So we've been talking about uh, why creditors are our allies, specifically about how uh, this can be quality assurance for our education and, and teaching and learning. If you enjoy topics like this, be sure and subscribe to us here on YouTube. Ring that bell down below. You'll get notified when we post new content. And of course, you can find Let's Talk Ed on all of your favorite podcasting platforms as well. So for Dr. Zahi Atala, I'm Chris Ford. We'll see you next time right here on Let's Talk Ed.